Perfect, perfect. All right. Hello, YouTube and Facebook. We are on our second project raising. Today we are discussing food. So what is that? So what is that's gonna look like is we're gonna spend 15 minutes discussing our current food system, what we do personally, what the world does, and what's working or not working about it. And then 15 minutes talking about what it could look like in an omni win anti rivalrous world. 10 to 100 years in the future, what is like the perfect food system look like for us? And then we're going to spend 30 minutes talking about the adjacent possible. So what could be done with 10,000 people and $100,000 right now? And we can get started. So would anyone like to start what they do for food, what they like about it, what they don't like about it? I'm going to stick to like two minutes each. I can um, absolutely sure. start. Go ahead, Edward. Okay. Um... <clears throat> I just want to bring up a couple things. Um, I, I think um, what we're seeing right now with the coronavirus and everything is is uh, showing us how fragile our um, you know supply chains are. Um, so much of our food system depends on that sort of thing, just like the rest of our <clears throat> systems. Um, you know, just in time supply and. All these things are, are extremely fragile. Um, so I would just like to raise that particular point. All right. Thank you. Yes, fragile is huge. Go next. Um, I have, in my house, like I use, eat a lot of takeaway and I eat a lot of processed food because I don't have the spoons to even think about what to cook, let alone um, make it. And at the same time, I don't really have the money to pay for takeout and packaged. But I also have two things that work really well in my life, which is my collective house, my co-housing community, where we eat and eat together three times, three to four times a week, where every adult shows up once a month and cooks and cleans. And I get to show up every other meal and pay the cost of food. And I don't have to cook and clean. As well as there is a nonprofit grocery store here called Quest that you need a referral to shop at. But it's all of like the the stuff that all the other grocery stores would throw out because it's damaged or about to expire. But instead of throwing it out, they donate it. And then people who are below the poverty line can buy it for a fraction of the cost of what they would buy. So to me, it had a lot more dignity than the food bank and I get to choose what works and what doesn't. And stock it ends up being stocking up on junk food a lot of the time, but they also have produce that needs to be used in a couple of days. So that is what I got going on. Well, what um, tends to stand out to me is um, the the fact that uh, buying junk food is generally cheaper than buying food that's actually good for us. Um, mm. It's uh, I think that that's that's an issue in terms of um, you know sort of continued poverty cycles of all of that kind of thing um, as well. So it's you know we need the nutrition in order to be able to um, to function well. Um, to be healthy, to be prepared for something like this coronavirus, because if you, you know, if you're immunocompromised, then you're more at risk. Um, so yeah, I would like to see, I would like to see that change. Um, in terms of stuff that's positive, um, I mean, it's nice to be able to do the things like online orders. It's nice that there are, you know, farmers markets around the place. So if you do that bit of research, you can actually go and get um, fresh produce here anyway. Um, and uh, I'm liking some of what I'm seeing in terms of like uh, permaculture and, you know, ecosystem um, regeneration and things like that, where they're focusing on providing food as well. So. Cool. I guess I'll go next. Um, so what I like about the current system, um, I, you know, it's not the best for everyone or the planet involved, but I do like the option to get uh, non-local things right so being in canada like i can still get avocados year round that that part's nice and you know pick your other fruit and veggies it's nice to be able to, to, to have that um it's somewhat efficient to have you know like the food shipped from the farms to sort of like some sort of a, sh a, sh a shipping warehouse that tends to be one of the more efficient ways to move that sort of like lo lo stuff but it does feel le less efficient uh, with how I, I, I think most people still get their food, which is, you know, each person goes to the uh, the grocery store, you know, eat, let's just say every week and sort of picks through their own stuff and then brings it home. It does seem 
not that efficient. Plus, while I do sometimes cook, it also seems less efficient for me to do the effort of, you know, the the food prep and the the cook time. I do like the uh, the co housing that Julie mentioned, where it's you know you might cook once a week or once every two weeks. You're cooking for a bunch of people, and then all the other days you don't have to worry about it because somebody else is cooking. I quite like that uh, uh, approach. And now we can have a bit of an open discussion if we want as to what is working and not working in this for the five or so minutes and then go on to the beautiful future we can we can create that's maybe not possible yet. But um, something else that came up, well, I liked a lot of what you wrote up, the fragile, the junk food being cheaper is a huge, is a huge piece. Mm -hmm. There was something else that was working, but I'll let someone else talk while I think about it. I do also like the permaculture stuff that Cody mentioned. I think that is quite, 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 quite interesting. And I'm sure still plenty of room to grow both just in our knowledge of permaculture and just in the number of people that are actually doing it. Yeah, I, I think uh, permaculture and regenerative agriculture in general is, is huge because it kind of hits two birds with one stone. It act actually works towards sequestering carbon, um, soils, you know, regenerating ecosystems. Um, so merging agriculture and bringing it from the industrial model to that sort of thing, I think is uh, really important. I remember two things, one of which was right now getting the meal delivery kits. I actually don't like them because co-housing is way better, but they do help me think about what to make. And there has to be a hybrid of those where like I can get stuff delivered. I have some of it in my fridge and some of it staple and then it knows what I'm making and helps me do it. Sorry, that's getting things out of out of sequence, what it could be. Um, but there's also this place local here called Abundance Farm that people can be part of. And of course, there's all those CSA, what they're called? The, the boxes of like you you get in with the farmer and then they, they send you boxes of food. They kind of know how many people they're feeding for the year and they plant accordingly. But Abundance Farm actually has the people who have the shares do the work as well. So you can come and you can be part of harvesting and part of planting and building whatever's on the farm. And then... Um, everyone has has a, has a part to play in that. I have an issue because I can't get out of there. I can't get out there with transportation. It takes like two hours to get there. But I love the idea of working together in community and growing your own food, even if you're not living there. And it, it's just more fun, right? They're not they're not having to harvest a certain yield. They're not paid per. It's just it's it, they're working together and harvesting together, and so they share in the in the, in the harvest and bounty. I'd be interested to know how much of our food is provided through um, through what should we call it, like the the old model of um, you know uh, sort of mass production with um, you know like all the pesticides and herbicides and everything that sort of you know destroys the soil versus you know how much is actually um, through you know the farmers markets and through you know like some sort of an organic approach, whether it's you know, whether it's permaculture or um, just a better kind of better kind of farming. Um, it's it's difficult for me to get a picture of how much of each is happening because I've got the interest in you know like the soil regeneration and so on. I get to see an awful lot of that come up in my you know my recommended readings and things like that. And I'm sure that it's actually a very 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 small percentage, and it's just in my face all the time. So. All right. Should we go on to the next the next phase, which is what is I think we probably know what's happening with food. I don't think any of this has been a shock to anyone. What? It's fragile? That That's why this one's so much shorter, that this is you know, generally what we concentrate on in societies, like what's broken and what's not working. And so moving on to the big, huge, utopian vision of the future that we all might be grandparents in one day. Does anyone have a bit of that they would like to share? Um, I'd like to bring up something, and that is... Um... I think it's valuable to look at this on a meta scale. And what I mean by that is that each unique location, you'll have rural areas, urban areas, um, rural communities, urban um, neighborhoods, um, individuals. Um, the solution is going to look a little bit different for everybody. Um, I don't think there's one size fits all solution for food production and food consumption. Um, so I, I think it's important to 
perhaps on a global scale or on a larger scale to create kind of like the design globally, manufacture locally um, concept for agriculture as well. So if, if, you know, places in the world that are trying different things unique to different locations can share that information and knowledge, and then people can have access to that and adopt it to their individual situation or individual location. I think um, that would be part of the solution for me. Absolutely. I envision a world of um, shared shared technology that, that, that it feeds back into the system, but also my own data feeds back into the system. As I think I'm going to eat something and buy it, or I don't think I buy it in my utopian future, but I was involved in the production of it and I have my food. I can also register what I threw out or what I didn't use all of. I would love someone else to do the executive functioning of, of I pick my meals and it tells me what what works for me and my family, what doesn't. Last time you made that, this got thrown out, maybe make less of it this time. Your neighbor's making it, let's let's share up. Um, the more we can use technology to make it as efficient as possible, as well as share in the labor of, you know, if, if I need to work a month on a farm every year to be able to pay for my food, I'm down with that, especially if it's if it feels good to work there. If there's music and and festivals and things that are don't don't make it feel feel arduous and having 3D 3D farms being able to just show up and say, here's what I'm getting and robots pick it for me. And having all of these things interwoven together where you can get your hands in the dirt and and grow it or you can have it produced for you and get the recipes and everything feeds back into it so you can know what the yield is. If I can tell you, we don't know what the weather is in, in the system and what the soil con conditions are and then we can put back in, well, you know, it grew eight tomatoes and they were the best this year. And I can coordinate with my neighbors. So if I, I grew too many tomatoes, I can, I can give them to my, to my neighbors. Maybe they grew too many watermelons and find a way to interchange the things that truly cannot grow here. Like even if we could grow bananas indoor in Canada, I still feel like it makes more sense to grow them somewhere else and ship them here because they're a huge tree, but maybe not. Maybe that's taking up a lot of, a lot of their real estate and transportation. So that's a bit of my how I would like to see. I, oh, and tailor made to me that also like my toilet is smart. And so it knows what nutrients are staying in my body and knows how to like help me pick a, a diet that does work for me. That's not one size fits all. And Petri dish meat. So I don't have to eat animals, but can get <laughs> the, the goodness. Sorry. Someone else go. <laughs> Do this all day. Well, that last bit sounds wonderful. Um, I think one of the things I'd like to see is a bit more, um, a bit more of a resilient spread of food so that, you know, we have more in the way of community gardens, that there are more, you know, fruit trees on the street, that there are more, you know, vegetable gardens that um, that people sort of allow access to, to each other. Um, it used to be in Australia, I think, like in the, in the, you know, like straight after the Depression era, that people would have, you know, fruit trees in their front yard and they didn't have the fences and, all that kind of thing. And it was the way that they were sort of working together to sort of make sure that, you know, everybody on the street was was fed. Um, I think I would like to see more of that and less of less of the shipping. Um, I think that we've just gotten comfortable with, um, you know, with the, with the idea of shipping things from around the world. And um, I don't know that we should be doing so much of it. Like some of it, sure, but... Um, yeah, by and large, I'd like to see a lot more, a lot more local, a lot more free, you know, simply because it's it's the effort that's going in rather than the money going in. Um, yeah, I think that'll do me. You guys will cover the rest of it. <laughs> All right. Um, I definitely like the idea of having more food being nearby, both the free and the paid versions, just so that we're less reliant on transportation, um, like the shipping and that sort of thing. If there's any issues there, then all of a sudden we lose the, the ability to feed ourselves. Um, I do like an emphasis on sort of not the like really manufactured foods with a bunch of preservatives, which you know, I think pretty much everyone knows and agrees like that's not great for you, but we do it anyway because it's easy um, and usually ch ch cheaper. And so to build a system that will either you know, allow, if you really want to cook, a system to make it a bit, I guess, e e uh, easier, 
both from the, the, the shopping, the tracking of what gets wasted, the possibly doing something useful with, with the waste. But my goal is always to sort of have people do what they're good at. I'm not necessarily good at, at cooking. So I feel like, you know, I could spend three hours to make something that somebody who's good at cooking could do in half an hour and do a better job at. Um, so I prefer to have sort of systems where there's an emphasis on, on, on local and almost like a meal su subscription plan where it's, again, not profit centered. So I'm not, you know, trying to buy some new Uber Eats person uh, yacht, but rather just the price of food plus, you know, five or 10 percent, you know, I guess, and the labor and whatnot. Um, understanding that that would probably mean you wouldn't have the full menu of options. If somebody is, if there's some sort of a meal plan, there's probably just going to be a couple of options. But if the food is good and the price is reasonable, that is fine with me. And then for food that like, you know, trying to get avocados in Canada in, 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 in winter, I do think that the price on that should probably be the real price. So right now, you know, we tend to sort of not price for the, the pollution and the shipping and, and, and everything else involved with shipping, you know, avocados from wherever they can grow to all over the world and all the other fruits and veggies that we're used to getting that maybe we in Canada shouldn't be used to getting year round. I think that's still available, but just the price is real. So, you know, if we can grow avocados in the summer, great, that's a reasonable price. If we lose the ability, okay, avocados, you know, they might be available, but they might be five or ten dollars a piece. So if you really want them, it's an option, but probably there's going to be less of that, I imagine. Unless, as Jubilee said, we find some way to grow bananas in Canada. <laughs> We're never going to be stuck with a lot less food in Canada. But yeah, um, to me also this, this now we can open up and I'll, I'll talk about the future 20 years from now. I mean, I think for me, eating in season is also a part of it that it's better for our bodies, it's better for the planet. But if it's available in stores, I'm gonna buy it and I'll still will buy it. But to be able to, to price it, to know that, well, if I'm getting avocados, there's a lot more labor I'm putting into the system or money I'm putting into the system uh, when, they're, when they're not available. But I maybe can get blackberries year round because they can grow indoors. But then should I be eating it? And that's part of the tailor making for my body is, is being able to track those things with, with my health, which of course isn't food specifically, but. I'm sure we will talk about that when we when we saw when we solution raise healthcare and health. So it comes back to I'm um, thinking of um, like price as a as an information signal that um, you know that tells you what's the you know what's the better thing to do versus the the worst thing to do. Um, you know if you've if you've got um, all of the costs of uh, of transport and what happens to the environment and so on actually included in. Um, a food product, then it's going to end up being a lot more expensive than the version of, you know, walking down the street and, um, you know, plucking something out of a community garden. Um, you know, so one is is better for the local area, um, probably better in terms of health and season and all that kind of thing. And that should be a lot cheaper and easier. Um, I think in a, you know, in a, in a society where you're trying to align what, works for each person with what works for the whole um, than just sort of focusing on um, having everything available. It's like you still want to have it available, but you should be able to know whether the choice that you're making is a good one or not. So. Something that came up from earlier talking is there's some people who have a very restricted diet who either due to health concerns like allergies or something like autism where they just can't you know, they want the same thing every day. And I feel like if that's you, you should, you shouldn't necessarily have to pay 15 bucks for an avocado, but there's a way to know that, right? Cause it's like, well, no, if you eat an avocado every day and it's very clear you do that and that's basically all you do, it's like avocado on toast, then yours can be somewhat offset by other people's. Um, yeah. Or help you find other things. Or maybe we do grow avocado locally for you, right? Having it be like you're more more allotted those things, and if everyone wants an avocado every day, then we figure we figure that out. How many do we need to grow locally? Yeah, or maybe at the other end, you just have more money available to be able to buy the things that you need. Mm -hmm. Also welcome. I think too. Um, 
putting a couple things together here um you know um consuming food closer to where it's produced um and thinking of special diets for people there's also technologies so you know you're trying to do things via permaculture but there's also technologies that allow you to grow avocados indoor vertical farming and stuff um so i, I think it's a real mix of different methodologies and modalities um and pricing um to have choice but also not externalize um that choice via you know transportation thousand mile transportation you know and that sort of thing and one of the things we didn't explicitly bring up during the first part which I do want to now bring up in the positive is like zero slave labor. Nobody is, is, and meaning also just really low labor. Nobody has to work 80 hours a week with their kids in the field to be able to feed themselves in order for us to get that offset. Um, externality, right? Like anything that's available to me for a Canadian, especially a Canadian, because we just talked about bananas, like anything that's available for a Canadian. And at that, that, um, labor point is also available around the world for people and to be able to help them grow that and do that, right? That any, anywhere, any, anyone, anywhere in the world can come together with their community and find a system for growing food together that is the most efficient, that is greenhouses and 3D farming and permaculture and that the rest of the world can help them, whether that looks like financing earlier on, helping do a barn raising type thing of building it or just, I want to know that my my bounty of my life doesn't come from the, the cost of somebody else's. It's never mind. It's never mind. Um, as, that's an, as another thing. So if, if you've got um, the technology in there to sort of talk about what stocks are everywhere of, of everything and you can kind of, you know, go in the same way as, you know, as at the moment I use Google all the time to say such and such near me. <laughs> And, you know, and I, and I find that, but I don't have the kind of information that might help in terms of, you know, what's the, what's the cheapest nutritious meal that I could create at the moment based on the stocks that are, um, that are available and to be able to pick up things that might otherwise get um, thrown out. Yeah, and to be able to, I have people in my life, especially in the community, who are amazing at that, even to the point where it annoys me. Like, I do, we just made, I was cooking on Monday, and we made rice, and I made way too much. And then the guy was cooking with, went and got rice out of the freezer, and he's like, we need to use this first, because it was made first. I'm like, no, but this stuff's fresh. But, like, he's amazing at knowing what's there and rotating it, and, and his partner's the one who knows what's, like, being grown right there and how to, and to be able to use that information. Because I just didn't even think that there was rice in the freezer freezer I wouldn't have made it to begin with right so to, to know those kind of things like what do I have on hand here what's nearby at the local store and I'm you know no I don't want to eat that actually but yes that that sounds like having two or three options of the local produce that is high stock would be amazing Even more so now I'm thinking of connecting with the neighbors where, because everyone, not everyone, but a lot of people would want that, right? The cheap, easy, high stock food. And so if you're all saying, yes, I'm going to cook that recipe, it actually can say, hey, how about you cook it? To, I'm assuming we all live in the same neighborhood. You cook it today, Kylie, and I'll cook one later, right? Like you, whether that's just a gift and you're like, yeah, I'm good at cooking today. I have the spoons. Or whether in literal spoons, energy. <laughs> it's a little more difficult when we're talking about food. <laughs> or, um, and then another day you don't have it, right? And you're like, hey, who has extra food? Who made an extra portion? I My food burns and I couldn't, or I just don't have the energy, right? To be able to kind of help each other in those, in those areas with as much trust built in as we need, right? If I need to see that Kylie isn't on her couch, not doing anything, when choosing not to, as everyone's really scared people will do then I can, I can be like, oh, look, she cooked for four other people last week. Yeah, I'm good with cooking for her now that she's got the flu, if we need that in there. How about you, Adriel? What does your beautiful future look like? Which you already share. I think you already did, but. For the long term, yeah, I, I shared a bit. Right. And also move on to the um, 
the adjacent possible now if, if it's like if we have five seconds of silence i'm ready to move on <laughs> <laughs> um i think the adjacent possible like when i was talking about sort of having the emphasis on local cooking and, and somebody else do it i think that could sort of be the, the 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 next step. People are already used to ordering food on their phones, you know, and like skip the dishes and at, at, at Uber Eats. I think you could make a sort of schedule up, up around that, where instead of it being like you, you're sort of paying a premium because you're getting it from, from a restaurant and you want it right now, if you were able to set some kind like sort of a Uber Eats and skip the dishes meets like a meal planning service, where you don't have a full, you know. A menu from every restaurant in your area there might be 10 things in a given week and you say oh okay i'm gonna you know eat that t -t -t twice in the week and sort of build your plan around that and then you would just get a d d delivery where instead of it being you know two pizzas it's like a bunch of pre-made meals that you throw in the fridge or the freezer and it's not priced at restaurant level you know and the you wouldn't have to charge as much for the shipping because it there would be an emphasis on for example, like, oh, we deliver food to your apartment building on Thursdays, so everybody in the building orders, and then the, the one person just, you know, has a probably a trolley going around, and, you know, it's a much easier delivery emphasis on making it efficient, and thus more cost effective, if that's how people actually want to feed themselves, just all day, every day. Yeah, I'd like having also a... Um... Like a commercial kitchen, just like we do at, at co-housing where it, they don't have a commercial kitchen, but you know you're you're cooking and shopping once, you're shopping, cooking, cleaning up once per round, generally for two different meals. And, but doing that on a grander scale of like, okay, we're doing kind of the the prep food of dishes, hopefully without the, the waste, because there's a lot of waste that comes with those. But when you're knowing that it's getting to get delivered to your neighborhood every two days because there's enough people in your neighborhood, like it's about meeting these thresholds and then having that that happened. So I know that I have the stockpile of balsamic vinegar and olive oil, and then they just deliver the other end. And we can even have it more delivered, like things are cut up because we've participated, we've put in our labor or we've offset, offset our labor with money. So at a, at a fair and decent wage, right? So I might put in 20 hours a month and get my food for free, or I might put in five hours and get my food at cost, like whatever it happens to be, right? Or I might think I don't have any time. And so I'll pay a little bit of a premium for not contributing labor in every level, right? Whether that's going to the store and buying it and, and doing the shopping online, whether it's sorting it, whether it's cutting it or transporting it, like whatever you want to do, as long as there's not a surplus of labor in that area and everybody wants to and doesn't want to do another, that, and that can be a metric, right? That it switches around. Driving is really, everyone loves it. So that when you put in an hour in five minutes for instead of an hour. I think too, um, <clears throat> closing some loops with waste, um, composting. Um, so, I mean, that could even happen in an urban environment. So, you know, if, if everyone can have food delivered, you can also have waste taken away and cycle back into the, the growing system. Yeah, and for 10,000 people that actually I, does I, work. I like that, especially if you've got the regular, like, here's, he, 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 here's your food, give me your waste, off to the next place. Here's your food, give me your yeah. waste, off to the next place. Right. That's super efficient. I like it. Yeah. I don't know if I want the waste in the same car as the, as the food. It might be like, you know, two people. There's two separate carts. <laughs> right. But having, um, like, we have compost pickup in Vancouver, and it's both gross and good. Mm. It's like a little gross not having, like, I think to some degree for having local farming, having local compost is good. The same guy who did the rice thing also is an amazing compost human being, like, always is like out there with gloves on mixing up the compost. I, it's like his meditation. Um, I don't know if every every neighborhood is going to be lucky enough to have one of him. <laughs> but uh, one of the other things is like for me, I don't feel confident in growing a garden. So I would really love to have a app that helps me with that. That actually literally is like the sun. Like here's my here. I can just do a 3D. Can and this is not 100,000. It's a little over the top. But it can start with a beta, right? Where it's just, hey, we know from Google Maps where your where your house is, and we assume the sun is here. Plant your, what do you want? And then here are the companion plants. And then if I can feed that information back into the system, and my neighbors use it, and so if I have a surplus of something, I can offer it to them. Or my raspberries come up earlier than theirs. Or I didn't even think I could grow raspberries, and then my neighbor has a has a bounty, 
And next year, you know, I'm I'm help with doing I can help with seed sharing and uh, soil regeneration, soil um, testing, and uh, to know to water it. Right, I've gone for a week, but my neighbor's also there. Can someone water mine? And gives me an alert on my phone to water it when I forgot. It's extra hot today. You might want to water it twice or water it here. I'm doing things like that that are adjacent possible. That's not that difficult. There's also a level of automation that can be introduced with technology like FarmBot. So FarmBot is really cool for, you know, it can be used in a community garden. It can be used in a backyard. And basically it's all open source. And, you know, you don't have to actually, if you don't want to do the planning, you don't have to, it, it's automated. And the, the information is shared and further information to be shared of, of the type that you're talking about. I'm reminded of a, um, a conversation I had with, a, I'm going to say a young young guy elsewhere in Australia um, last year. He was talking about getting into, you know, into farming, but he didn't have any kind of land in order to do it. So we were talking about this possibility of having sort of a almost like a, a an a commons app set up such that people who have land but don't want to garden could set aside a certain amount and say, you know, hey, I've got, um, you know, 10 square metres of, of land here that's, you know, that I'm happy for other people to, you know, garden for me um, and that they would then get, you know, like a box of food or something, you know, every so often um, as well. So that way it could sort of be a group of people who are interested in, you know, like in doing all of that tending and the composting and all that kind of thing, who could then run, a, you know, like a whole neighbourhood, if you like, to cover sort of all needs and then distribute out um, food to anybody who is participating or sell it at markets or whatever the case may be. Um, <laughs> we're both kind of excited about that as a concept, but... Uh... <laughs> I love that. One of the other things is um, just tracking, like, what I'm buying where. And especially if it's an easier thing to track, if I literally just take a picture of what's on my conveyor belt and my receipt and it somehow matches it up. Again, not 100,000. It would be more people who want to match it up to know. to, And then it learns from there. But And then as that continues, you're able to see at what point it makes sense to grow our own or to produce our own crackers or whatever it, it might be. Or just bulk buy together. Right. I think one of the first things that probably doesn't need to be there when we have the infrastructure is grocery stores, that if I can get it delivered to me and I don't need it to sit there and they're paying for rent and I'm driving there and driving back and getting the coronavirus from being there, then we can you know, like it's it's a lot more convenient to have it delivered. It's actually shown to be more environmentally friendly. I believe that everyone getting their groceries delivered to their door. For, and again, that's something we could share in the labor of. It's not zero effort to do that. Someone has to organize it. Hopefully it's not in plastic bags. But having that that sorting where you're just bulk buying and then sorting it together and you're able to know, like, if you really want Cheerios, maybe get Cheerios. But if if you if you switch to this cereal, it's way less because it's the most popular and we can bulk buy it in, in large quantities. And it would be, you know, a warehouse and 10,000 people could absolutely do that in a sustainable way that they then if they invited the rest of their city there would be no grocery stores in that city rather soon, which is scary if it's owned by somebody else or a conglomerate. But if we own it and everything's at cost, as long as the producers of the food are still there, we don't need the middleman. Right. I think it is important. Like there's an element that I would like to see. Well, I'm all about technology and the efficiencies there. I also don't want our food to rely on it. So something like, you know, you have an app that teaches you, hey, you know, do this and water this and that. But I think before you get to that step, you have like an encyclopedia of here's how to grow tomatoes. Here's how to, you know, get seeds from tomatoes. Here's how to, root. like the end to end of what you would need to be able to plant yourself, you know, kind of become a farmer if you had to. And then to make sure that there's sort of local printed copies of that where, 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 wherever possible. So it was an app that makes it sort of, you know, a bit easier and more efficient. Anybody can do it. And then there's sort of some local printed copies of here's how to grow it, here's how to harvest seeds, here's all the stuff that you need to know to set up your own sort of renewable food system without the use of any technology. And to know who that person is, not right. not necessarily like, but like who in your community is the best is the best at growing food? Who has that right. information in their head? Because I those books exist. Right. Those books exist at co-housing. I'm still like, 
sorry, where do I grow my tomatoes? Right. <laughs> like to be able to get that guidance, but I would be able to learn through somebody else and through an app and then to know, to always have that conversation and we can't be too reliant on this technology. Right. Right. I guess we all starve now. The internet's down. Yes. <laughs> and make sure, you know, we have enough seeds and, and when ours is down, if it isn't a global thing, all of the internet goes down like a solar flare or something that we, we know who's eating and who's not, and we can ship food to them when needs be, even if we are trying to stay local. Like we don't let our communities, neighboring communities starve. Right. Hopefully. Exactly. <laughs> That's not tangential tomorrow, sadly, but I think it actually is adjacent possible to have an understanding of what food growing systems are out there and which ones produce the highest like yield for every individual um, like the geography, right? For the, the climate and is it a greenhouse? Is it outside? Is it 3D farming? Is it permaculture? And can you have a combination? But if a community wants to grow, what's gonna be their most efficient? And if we're feeding that back into the system, the information and sharing the intellectual resource, that can be very powerful. Yeah, I like not having it all in, um, in the technology system. I was actually just thinking it might be a uh, good, you know, for the early part of schooling to not just have, you know, like the reading, writing and, and arithmetic, but growing mm -hmm. as well. Hell yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would, I, that's definitely should be a part of schooling. Like the, I don't think probably anyone here has really had proper schooling in how to grow your own food and, you know, how to survive if there isn't a grocery store to go and buy stuff from. Um, and then also, probably an important thing is to figure out, you know, which seeds are, are terminator seeds and which things have sort of been made to not be long lasting and make sure that we're not dabbling in that area. Cause that's incredibly, that seems incredibly dangerous for sort of long-term being able to feed a, a community and not being reliant on the overall system is like, oh yeah, but you can only grow those tomatoes for three generations and then they're going to stop. Right. And knowing who's, who's holding the heirlooms, right? right. Who has, like not because you have to, but because, hey, you're really passionate about heirloom tomatoes. We know where to go for heirloom seeds because right. you're that person. Yeah. I think yeah. there are different breeds as well. Like in, in an area, you want to have many different breeds. So it's not just to have some of the seeds right. set aside by some people, but to, um, you know, like intentionally have 30 different varieties of tomatoes growing. Right. To totally. One of the other things I love about a gardening app is that I can get real world advice where it's like, hey, this bug's on here. Yeah, cool, that's fine. That bug's eating your right. other bugs. Hey, this <laughs> is good. this has this brown stuff. This is, you're watering it too much. You're not watering it enough. You're like to actually get real time information. So I don't have to wait till I don't get any yield. It can actually help me while I'm going and I'm willing to reach out. And, and if people are willing to do that labor, right? To say, yes, I'm a gardener. I know what that is. That'd be great. And hey, maybe there's someone who cultivates ladybugs, right? Who's like, I have ladybugs for you. I, you can, if you have aphids, come get some baby ladybugs. They don't fly right. away. That'd be cool. Worms and all yeah. that. I think for the next step, it does seem like a lot of these are components that you would definitely want to solve as soon as possible. I think that like, if you, uh, I'm not sure if somebody said it here or this is just in, in all the conversations that you and I have had on this topic, Jubilee, but something like the, you know, the meal de delivery app, starting out by identifying sort of areas that are interested and areas that have like kind of a soup kitchen nearby that could act as the commercial kitchen. And then you can also say, hey, while we're here, maybe five to 10 or, or more percent ends up staying in the soup kitchen to two feet homeless people. Um, but then you are, are dealing with much bigger volumes of food and, you know, and making that same use of the time. And you're sort of also then in that area, once you get that established and you have either, you know, people participating or ideally in the early stages, just paying customers, then you can, you know, either seek to expand and, or say, oh, we're actually in a good setup with this soup kitchen. There's a plot nearby that we could buy and start to, you know, like set up a, a community garden where the end goal is you'd start with just the sort of the system as we have it, where the soup kitchen would just go and buy the ingredients either from a grocery store or if they can swing it and have the connections from lo local farmers and then use that to either try and set up more of those spots or starting to actually grow your own food and starting to, 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 to attract that. That seems sort of like the next step from where we're starting now. 
Yeah, I think there's there's next steps in all of these places, right? There's like how we grow food together, the next step. There's how we like the labor we put into our food already, right? Even if we're disconnected from it, we go to the grocery store, we prep it, we, you know, have to clean up after to be able to, to make that more efficient, to have a recipe sharing, to have that knowledge base. And then also the, the, the end, right? That we want the compost, we want it to go back into the system and stay there. And then I kind of adjacent is also like all of the um, packaging and stuff that's there, right? If we can have a conversation about packaging and what is currently being done, like mm. restaurants, I eat at restaurants a lot. I like the idea of being able to plan my life ahead of time, let's say a week in advance or a couple of weeks in advance and get a discount because I'm saying, hey, I know I'm getting pizza this day, right? And they're like, okay, if you're getting pizza on Saturday, then you need, if you get it delivered at six in your neighborhood, you get a, you get a 15, 20% discount, right? Or whatever, because you're sharing in that delivery thing. Maybe the delivery driver gets more to be able to say, okay, well, pad thai, like ra- restaurant, if they know they're making 30 pad thai dishes, they can do it much more efficiently than doing it on a one-off basis, right? And mm-hmm. having those conversations with the restaurant of like, what could you offer this at? Right. And having them um, saying like five things, the collective house that I'm part of, the common house, having that be made available in churches and schools, anywhere that does have a commercial kitchen if they want to, right? To say, hey, this is a space we can, that isn't necessarily soup kitchens and homeless people, they're invited too, right? They're one of the community members, unless they have an addiction or health challenge that they're not able to cook. Maybe they have hepatitis and you know what I mean? We don't we don't want it, but they they find it, they clean, they sweep the floor, but like it's an invitation that everyone's equal and everyone gets to contribute to the food. And then if, if someone truly doesn't, they're offsetting theirs with, with a lot more money. Right, I do, I do like that because the like setting a percentage for how much of the food goes to the homeless is helpful, but then also like, you also kind of always want to make it more. So to actually say, hey, everyone, you know, even if you aren't homeless, you can still participate and get your food either cheaper or free by doing, you know, by cleaning, by cooking, by doing any of these things that's open to the homeless pe- people as well. I like that. Maybe if they want to earn a little extra money if they're getting paid to it. Like if there's tons of people who don't have the time, right? They're doctors, they're lawyers. They're, they're like, listen, it's not worth it for me to come and put 20, like I'd rather pay someone 25 bucks an hour right. to take my spot. And as long as it's done with dignity, at least that's my wanting. Like, I don't want it to be like tears. You're better than, and I paid for it. So I get it. It's like, no, everyone contributes, but some people have more time to contribute and they don't have money and other people have money and don't have time to contribute. So let's share in that. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, Kyla, I think you're missing something. Oh, I, was, I was just thinking, um, like, that. I mean, that is definitely a, a step that could be taken soon. Mm-hmm. I wonder whether there might be, you know, in the in the long term, sort of more power in developing the, the resilience at the beginning of the food chain rather than sort of at the end of it, you know, so making, you know, something that's sort of more focused on the, um, on that gardening side or more focused on the, the creation of like raw foods and the distribution of those. Do you know what I mean? Like, so I think meals are important, but it's kind of, it's kind of assuming that all of the ingredients are there. Right. And they're going to come yeah. from a brittle system. So yeah. Um, that was just what I was pondering. <laughs> I love the idea of having, this is what I've had, when I've because we have a lot of cute, like little um, produce places that are close by that have way cheaper produce. And uh, they're mainly Indian food because that's the neighborhood I'm in. Um, that being able to know what is offered at that local store and have somebody say, oh yeah, I walked in and made this meal. And then have them be able to put that in the system so I can be like, I can just walk in. Like using someone else's intellectual labor because they're amazing at that and I'm not to be like, oh, this is in season, I can make this meal for five bucks, right? And that is something that is possible, but it's only possible on the larger scale than 10,000, right? I would need 10,000 people in Vancouver putting their information in for that that to happen. But we do know what's in season in Vancouver. So mo- almost everywhere would have cheap cucumbers at the same time or cheap whatever at the same time. So having a chef put in a system that's like, yes, I can't tell you what's at your local store, but I can say this meal is probably gonna be way cheaper than normal. And then if you work with that, with the staples, we know are almost in everyone's kitchen. If you don't have those staples, you can bulk buy them at this price, then we're able to do it at a much more, more efficient level to say right now, that's not the growing, right? But like, um, then we're working with, hey, then Canada is a very short growing season. So we have, I, my mind goes more to the, the other side of it. 
But during growing season, all of your neighbors have peas right now. Everyone has spinach right now. Here are the things you can make with that. And you can buy it from your local, your next, next door neighbor, right? They're collecting it. Here's the price point. There are all their food that they have extra goes somewhere and we're selling it out to people. So you don't have to worry about the, I'm buying it for my neighbor and I got to go get it. And then I'm buying this from them, you know, making it more efficient. Mm -hmm. So Kylie, when you're talking about sort of uh, helping out the earliest part of the system with people doing individual farms, are you picturing almost like a crowd farming where instead of it being one big farm that's off in the distance that, that, that sends it back and forth, you just have like anybody with a, a plot of land, you know, there's some system that would figure out as Julie was sort of hinting at what to grow when and who's already gr growing what. So like, nope, we've got enough cucumbers to thank you. Maybe plant some peas. Um, where that sort of the, the, the first step is to replace the, the big farms with, you know, a thousand small farms. Um, yes, yeah, so well, I might not even think of it in terms of farms. It's more like a right, like um, micro farms, like not true farms, but a garden. Yeah. And look, um, it's probably part of this is me thinking about um, so not really high density living, but you know suburbia. Okay, so it's like you actually have a pretty good sized backyard, and even a front yard, and like yeah, you got quite a, a bit of space to grow it. Yeah, not even huge, but just right. you know something where you can where you could grow something. Right. Um, but, you know, like, I, I think that there's a lot of people who are not interested in, you know, in growing it themselves, but right. that, you know, might be interested in having their land be made available for people to come mm -hmm. in and do the growing there and in return get some of the, um, get some of the produce. Right. From that. Yeah. And, so you know, like, it's like you can contribute your time and, you know, like the you know skills, you can also contribute the land that you own. Yeah, and if it's or rent, if it's one right. Right. It's backyard. Right. Okay. Oh, he said, or you own, and I'm like, I rent where I am, but I could say right. yes, you can use my backyard, right? As long as I okay sure, with yeah. the upstairs neighbors. The, the yeah. land that you're legally permitted to let people grow on. Yeah. yeah. I just want to share that, like at co-housing, it's in Vancouver. It's some of the most expensive lands on the planet. And um, in three lots, that's what they grew. These they grew. They grew forty units on three on three lots. They built, but they have um, a greenhouse. This like beautiful growing space. They grow in every square inch that you can grow in. And for about May till October, nearly every bite of salad that we make is grown there. Like next door neighbor, we go and eat blue. I'm like, how do we eat the blueberries from the neighbor when like they're one house and we're, you know, 40, 40 households or whatever. But it's um, you can grow a lot in an urban area. And this is in Vancouver, not even suburbia, where it's everyone has their own backyard. The next door neighbor has a beautiful big backyard who grows the blueberry. But we've grown on about three of those plots. Yeah. There was a I used to live in East Vancouver and there was this one house that had this really interesting setup where they actually had a sign explaining it, I think more so that people wouldn't steal their food. Um, but they had this really narrow strip of land and I think they were calling it the 100 meter diet or something like that on the, the sign where, where the idea was that A, it was like in your yards, it was 100 meters you know, from your house, but it was also like you fed yourself on, I think it was 100 square meters or some smaller uh, 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 amount of that. And in their front yard in Vancouver, they had like wheat growing and like a bunch of, of other things that you don't normally see grown in Vancouver or even in cities in general that I think like that sort of a, a, a setup but on a bigger scale in suburbia could be very cool where you're driving down a suburbia and instead of, you know, the, j just kind of the boring manicured lawns, you're seeing like wheat and yeah and, and tomatoes and peas and like people's front yards and then who knows what their backyards are like probably even more. What I really like about like a, the sorry, go ahead, Edward. Oh, I, I think another thing to consider um, is surplus um, and community resilience in terms of uh, preparing for disaster. Um, you know, drought or that the Cascadia fault, you know, happens. Um, and so, how do you factor that in? Um, storage surplus, what do you store? Um, you know, how does that get distributed? Mm, yeah, and cool. having like tool libraries of things like canning and then DIY canning workshops, right? And we have a surplus and we're pickling yeah, these cucumbers yeah. and doing 
doing those kind of things and knowing having a, a database of that, right? To know that so many pickles we have. By the way, the number of people that are involved, we actually only have two days worth of food, just so we're mm -hmm. clear. Like you can actually even do that that math, right? Um, what, what I wanted to share was what I love about the gardening app idea, right? And knowing this plan and knowing that I can share with it is if it was an app, right? If it wasn't just, um, I don't know, on paper or something, is that I could also share my labor when I'm capable of it, right? On a day I have more spoons, I can be like, who's got work for me to do, right? Like I could go weed my neighbor's lawn, right? I can, I have 10 minutes of time to do. And so I can do it in small bursts or I can do, you know, it's, it's done on my schedule and yet it would still be tracked and put into a system of here's how much food I get out of it if I needed that to happen or just, hey, I'm really good putting in an hour worth of time knowing that it feeds my neighbors. Yeah. I mean, and, and with an app, you also, uh, uh, you unlock other cool options like, you know, if you're having like a crowd farming and each individual plot has you know, its own things, you can do, you can do crop cycling. Like, hey, you grew corn last year, maybe grow cabbage this year. And then you can also have an overall, you know, snapshot of, okay, there's a thousand farms in this, you know, small village. Here's what each one is growing. You know, you, if you want to start up a, a, a new one, great. Here's what other people are growing. Here's what we need. And if you want to get fancy, you could like test the soil and figure out what might actually grow the best there. <laughs> laugh because it's like what if the insects get the app and they're like oh the cabbage is over here we're gonna go to the cabbage <laughs> don't give them ideas you boy <laughs> the ants like, yes this is awesome you know ants will be the first ones yeah. got their little their little gps devices instead of 5g killing everything just all all the bugs learn how to speak <laughs> or the bees tell each other. The bees tell them. The bees are all over the place. They're yeah. like, just so you know, there's some some of these over there. <laughs> That's sidetracking. <laughs> but, <it is> happens. <laughs> but yeah, no, crop rotation is huge. And knowing, you know, like both for insects and then also for nutrients, right? That this one mm -hmm. fixes the nitrogen. And part of that is like we grow in that way even though I don't grow, we grow in that way. And it's never, it doesn't really grow in the quantity we want to use them. It grows in the quantity that works for the, the, the ecological footprint of those plants, right? So there's also like, hey, we have a surplus of beans because they're nitrogen fixing, but we're not eating enough beans. We can find a way to eat more beans, or we can also use that to pay, for, pay to, to feed animals, right? To be like, hey, we have excess, excess food. We can put this in, into that or, um, and that animals, we can grow chickens yeah. locally and goats. Yeah. And in the short I term, you can goats. Also trade that in, you know, just typical game A, like we have a ton of, of beans. I'd really want some avocados, right? Like, and just do a, a just a regular sell our beans for money and use the money to buy avocados. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think Snow once you've got a network of that going, you could also do like proper, you know, where if, in, you know, because we're in Vancouver and a certain, a certain, Growing season, we just have cucumbers all year long. Maybe in an area where, for whatever reason, they can't grow good cucumbers, but they have you know good berries or apples or something. You could start to to set up sort of medium to long term sh shipping, but it's sort of meant as more of like a trade. Like, hey, we're going to send you two truckloads full of beans. Please send us two truckloads full of apples. Mm -hmm. And while it's not ideal from like a long term shipping perspective, it does help unlock some of that other food that maybe you wouldn't be able to have in probably the most uh, uh, ideal way possible. Yeah, I think we should wrap up this section possibly by saying what we think is the most um, powerful adjacent possible that we talked about. You don't need to pick a new one. You can pick the same one. And then, um, yeah, we can end it. Uh, I think for me, I like the idea of something sort of like, uh, you know, scheduled food app for something like Uber Eats, where it's actually helping people save money and eat better. And at the same time, that organization or app or whatever is starting to gain money so that it can then go out, you know, and buy some garden plots or start to sort of grow in its in its purpose with, you know, still mostly playing by game A rules. I can say my next. Uh, I'm. I for me, my in my life, what I would find most powerful 
is a way for the recipe sharing to know what I can I can afford with both my spoons and my money to be able to know what I can create and then be able to coordinate with my neighbors and other people to bring that purchasing power up. Um, even though I do think the most powerful is the gardening. Yeah, uh, for me. Sorry. Um, oh, that's okay. Um, yeah, just to start some test projects, um, you know, maybe something in an urban environment, something in a rural environment, and just start sharing information. Awesome. I want all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't think it's quite that crazy, if, if that makes sense. It's like the data that you would need um, at the level of, you know, recipe sharing or, of, you know, like wanting a particular kind of meal or, or something along those lines, that could fairly easily flow up from the what do we have from this gardening that we're all doing? What are we missing that we might be able to trade on? What do we have a lot of? And, you know, people putting in there, this is how I'm using it. That's then there yeah. next year when you've got, a, you know, like a surplus of the same thing. And, you know, like the, oh, we, we canned this or we preserved this and this is how you do it. And when you've got a, you know, like when you have a fair bit of that information and if you have something that's sort of community um community-based in terms of gardening, you can also pull in the education for kids, you know, like that, are, you know, that it, it can be like whether it's some part of a normal school system or just, a, you know, like everybody bring your kids along for um, like for a day's gardening or something like that. So I think, um, you know, it's like I like all of the ideas. I'm just wondering whether they actually needed to be separate or whether you could have one thing that kind of just grows and, and flows sort of from the, you know, from the beginning to the to the end. I think we absolutely can have it all. And I like that, that, that they do all yeah. feed into each other. But it's starting with one data that would be $100,000, right? So it would be prioritizing what's the most impactful we have. And then, yeah, clearly, like, I want it to go down to, like, the growing the food and up to the efficiency with my neighbors and working with schools and making sure everyone in my neighborhood's fed. And yeah, no, we can do this. Like this, that's what this project raising, or sorry, solution raising is, is like, this was possible, right? Like not maybe the four of us, but if there were 10,000 people putting in $10, we could create a food app that we own together and it could continually get better and better. And who wouldn't want to use that? Who wouldn't want to use a recipe sharing app that I could even like just a database of recipes is huge. Like they exist everywhere online, but then I can be like, hey, I'm gluten-free. How do you make this into gluten-free? How do you make this into peanut-free? How do I have these seven people coming and they all have different dietary restrictions. Give me a freaking recipe I can make. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of improvement to be made in the area of recipes and, and meal planning and stuff. Like the same recipe books, everyone does it the same way. And it's the most like, it doesn't help with the planning your meals and like going out and shopping for it. It doesn't really help with the like knowing what to group together. You have to kind of read through the recipe and figure out, okay, so I can put these things in the same bowl and these things in the same bowl. Mm -hmm. There could very easily be an app that would help you from end to end. It would help you say like, oh, okay, I'm in an area that has the, the, these, you know, cheap and, and plentiful ingredients. Please help me plan meals using these ingredients he heavily. And then from yeah. the, the things like you, you build your meal plan, and then it just says, oh, okay, you have to go out and buy eight pounds of onions and, you know, 12 pounds of potatoes and that spread across 30 different recipes. But I don't know any app that even comes close to doing that kind of thing. No, it's something we would, could, would create together. I think something kind of like adjacent to the idea of like the, the uh, app that would help you sort of schedule meals being D d d delivered is something that I've been trying to figure out how to do in my building because I, I, I live in an apartment and I'm not all that tidy. And so I've always thought like, could you get a housekeeper for cheaper if you, for example, lived in an apartment building and there was 10 other people or 30 other people in your building or on your floor that also needed the same service and could schedule like, oh, Wednesday is when our floor housekeeper comes. If you want in on it, you know, you can get 20 or 25% off that housekeeper, you know, has a, a bunch of work available and only has to travel to one spot. 
yeah, the more we can create a central thing, we can yeah. create and all of these app, things. But stop solving a new food. problem. That's a whole other solution. Right? Right. Shared so labor, labor that's plus. That's the same solution, though. It's the it's the, the same sort of identifying a need, whether it's a scheduled meal or you know a shared you know bulk housekeeping. Sort of having people raise their hand in an area, say, "I'd be interested," and then once you hit a certain threshold, you say, "Great." You know, the housekeeper that I, uh, you know, that we're that we're working with said that as long as we had ten people, we can get it for X price. Cool. We just hit ten people. Let's start doing that. Oh, the soup kitchen and group that that, that we talked to says that we need you know a hundred people in this area in in this neighborhood to participate. Yeah. Let's start gathering them. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't think that's 10,000. I think that's like when we have more people because that Jubilee, I did not Jubilee, Jubilee, like the threshold of flipping where like, if we have 10 million people who are willing to not pay debt and not accept debt, we can cancel debt, right? That's the idea right. of Jubilee yeah. or I don't know what the level is, but yeah, having that so that it's like, this is the threshold you need to start a tool library in your city. Here's the threshold you need to start anything in your, in your mm -hmm. community. And then having people, a working group of those people be able to create it but i think we're getting into different solutions now we've, we've already fixed food we've moved on we've moved on to the next so unless anyone has any more burning stuff to say we will say goodbye to youtube and facebook and have a quick wrap up all right goodbye facebook goodbye youtube you're welcome we fixed food for you thank you